Chris Brown, Steve Tasker with you. Thank you for joining us. Pleased to be joined now by the co-host of the Athletic Football Show and also NFL analyst for Yahoo Sports. It's Nate Tice joining us here on the program. Nate, good to have you with us. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, we're all on the wide receiver train uh, here okay. in Buffalo, uh, especially with Gabe Davis out the door in Jacksonville. Uh, I think a lot of people believe that the Bills have to get a receiver prospect uh, that has number one wideout potential, maybe not right away, but maybe in a year or so from now um, when there could be a judgment day on Diggs' contract uh, next year at this time. Uh, I know you've been busy with the mock drafts yourself, um, even did one with Mina Kimes. So why don't you just lay on us kind of how you – looked at wide receiver prospects and what might work for Buffalo. Yeah. Receiver for me is someone that can play on the outside. I think that's first and foremost, which typically is the guy that well could grow into a number one guy, uh, a traditional X receiver like Stefan Diggs is an X receiver kind of by his archetype, but he doesn't look like that traditional build, you know, that, you know, Michael Thomas would be a, a recent example of this type. Deandre Hopkins would be another guy that usually those big, longer receivers so if you're looking at this draft, and it's a deep receiver draft, it has high-end talent, and different tiers have some interesting players. Uh, a guy in the range that the Bills are taking is A.D. Mitchell from Texas. Uh, might He's kind of growing a little bit because he literally jumped out of Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis during the Combine. And so I think everyone's like, Ooh, that, who's that guy that was just flying? Big, tall, long receiver. Uh, really, like his ball skills that's how he wins is is true ball skills he will be a red zone threat right away i think he will take some time and i think he he is going to be more situation dependent than maybe some of these other first round receivers but i think his upside is as high as anybody uh again a true outside guy that i think would pair well with josh allen could take a top off the defense with and he's a good route runner already um and has again like i said has ball skills it's just more about consistency with him so i think when he goes to a spot with a quarterback that's a true blue elite guy like Josh Allen, he'll, he'll have a little more pep in the step, you know, than maybe Quinn Ewers throwing a, ball, a couple balls over his head. Uh, other guys that are more of those taller receivers, Brian Thomas from LSU, he might be gone by this point if the Bills do not move up. He is someone that looks like an X long receiver, but I actually think his play style is more like a smaller receiver. So almost, he's like the inverse of, Diggs, where Diggs is a little bit smaller, not smaller, but average size for a receiver, but plays bigger. Thomas is more of a big guy that plays smaller, and I mean that as a compliment. He has really good footwork. He's a really good athlete, but he hasn't been really tapped into yet until this last year. He's super productive, but there's more to his game. You'll see him take the top off. He, he's got speed for days. And again, he's got he's a developing route runner that already shows flashes, but I think he's got even more to it. Like, I, I think that it's like still working with it. He's going to take a little bit of time, but once he gets there, he can do things that not a lot of six, three, six, four guys can do. Uh, so again, it's a different flavor of another guy that can win from the outside. So those are the two in the first that I have look as a true first rounders. If you get into maybe the second round types, you got Kean Coleman from Florida state, true big ball winner, not a lot of juice, but plays a little faster in his time speed or Troy Franklin from Oregon. Another tall, slender receiver, very twitchy. But I mean, I mean it when I say slender. He, he's very, very skinny. Uh, but uh, plays a little. He plays big. But I, I do like him. But I look at those guys as more second round types. But there's a lot of flavors to like if you like receiver. I've kind of wanted them, maybe the Bills, to go in a different direction in the first round, which maybe we could talk about, and maybe focus on receiver in the second round. And there's a whole batch of names there, but I could go on for days about yeah, this. That, I can't tell. We, I, also, I, I would recommend to the people listening, go to Yahoo Sports and read Nate Tice's breakdown on the top five, six. What, these are the top six or seven receivers behind Marvin Harrison Jr. Great breakdown of what their pluses and minuses are. And you're right, a guy like Troy Franklin, who is, as you said, alarmingly skinny. Um, yes. and, and, yeah, so you got you know breakdowns like that, and and that's one of the things Bills fans I think would would benefit from when you do talk about other positions. And we we believe me, we're chewing this up every day here. When you are talking about other positions that the Bills may have a shot at, maybe getting maybe close to an elite kind of player, and at, at twenty eight, where you've got six or eight offensive tackles in the mix, you got four or five quarterbacks that are going to be taken. You got maybe a couple of guy elite guys at different like a safety and a tight end. Uh, that are going to be taken up there as well. What are, are you thinking outside the receiver position of an elite guy that may be there at some other position? 
uh, because you mentioned it a little bit, uh, this is a top heavy and another position that's deep is offensive line and another position. I'm going to be repeating some of the same idioms I just used, but uh, whatever flavor you want here at offensive line. And there, there is high end tackle talent, the Joe Alts of the world. There are versatile guys that we're not exactly sure what their position is best. Yeah. Uh, uh, like Graham Barton from Duke. Uh, Troy uh, fought new from Washington, but they, it's like, Ooh, I, I like you here. You might be better here, which is a good thing. And there's plenty of other guys I could talk about here, but I offensive line, especially the interior is, I don't think the bills should just act like, okay, we have decent options this year. Let's not address it this year. I think if you have somewhat of a question mark at offensive line, which I think the bills do, I, I, I get with why they did it, why they have David Edwards here, why they moved Connor McGovern to center, moved on from Mitch Morse. I understand it from a team building. I think if you're looking at it past 2024, getting a guy with true blue chip talent, a true pedigree, a true first rounder with the, on the interior and really shoring up that interior for the long term, I, I would like that. Now you got a Cyrus Torrance and a, a center or a left guard. That, and there's guys in this draft that I think could fit that bill. Graham Barton I already mentioned from Duke, one of my favorite players in the draft. I have him as, I think, my 12th overall player, which is high, <laughs> I will admit. Uh, but he just tested out of the gym. Uh, he is a played left tackle at Duke, but has also played other positions, including center. There's been some questions about what his best spot is in a good way because he can handle so much. I would give him still a shot at tackle. I don't think the Bills need that, and I think that's a good thing. But in a pinch, he could fill out there. But for me, guard, center, anything, any long-term fit, he can fill that out. And I think you're just – adding pedigree and stockpiling a position that's always going to be of need. And it's just one of those things where I don't want, you know, good to be the enemy of great as far as the team building uh, process for the bill. So that's one name that comes to mind for me is offensive line, especially the interior. That's maybe some of my background kind of peeking through. And then other, other position I've kind of outside receiver to be less sexy, but still kind of sexy, I would say is edge rusher or a defense alignment, because that's just to me is McDermott has always liked the deep defensive line and just rotating those guys. So they're kind of a spot where these defensive linemen are going to be going in the 20s. Um, I don't see a lot of top 10 type talent that they can get a Jared Verse type or something like that that could make sense for them. Yeah, what do you like about Verse's game that you think kind of fits? Like what kind of pass rusher would you describe him as? Is he a, yeah. you know, a, a power guy or is he a speed off the edge guy? Maybe just kind of do a thumbnail sketch for our listeners. Yeah, he you kind of hit it, hit it right there. He's a power guy. He is all about effort. Uh, he tested very well. He's not the most agile player. You know, it's bendy. Him and uh, you know, him and Von Miller. Yeah, they did. They didn't do not bend the same. But he is good against the run. He really is a. I like him as a good number two pass rusher, like a very good one, but also good against the run, which is why I think McDermott, who I will have say in some of his personnel stuff, I, I think that he will like this type of guy, gritty but a good athlete on top of the grittiness, but also just, well, just push guys back, push guys back, crowd that pocket, crowd that pocket. So if you have other guys that can get after the passer, say like a guy named Ed Oliver, you know, that is really complimentary for those, or, or you know, Rousseau or someone like that. Those are very complimentary pieces, and he's a different style than those guys. Ed Oliver is a gap shooter. You know, Rousseau is more bendy and long and all that. So it's a nice, different flavor for their defensive line. I'll use a, I'll find a different synonym for flavor by the end of the show. I, I, I guarantee it. But I, I like him for what the Bills are set up for. And in this range is where I'm comfortable taking verse. I don't look at him as a top 15 guy, but anywhere after pick 15, I'd like him. And maybe he can fall to 28. What team has, and you know, we talk about the Bills all the time, kind of a little bit to the point of distraction of, and we don't keep track of anybody else. Is there a team in this free agent <laughs> process thus far who has completely changed their prospects for their draft class. I mean, I, the Bills took a little bit of the wide receiver pressure off when they got Curtis Samuel, and, and that kind of thing happens every year for every team. But yeah. what team has completely changed their fortunes, in your opinion? Oh, I would say, I don't know if this is good or bad, but the Titans went down a whole different path than I thought they were going to go down. So I don't know. Again, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I will say it affected their draft because uh, where they were taking in the top 10, it was, it was a receiver, it was offensive line, but well, now I kind of, kind of well, earmark offensive line there because they added Calvin Ridley. So again, not sure if that's good or bad. You obviously got to say Kirk Cousins to the Falcons is a gigantic move. And again, that's, that's just, you have to note it as a, a thing that did happen. Um, I actually liked what the Rams did 
a little bit because of who they added on offensive line, Jonah Jackson, um, who they added at tight end, Kobe Parkinson. Those guys, their offense was one of my favorite watches last year, along with the Bills offense with both coordinators. But the but what what the Rams were doing, I like they have really morphed into a power ish run game, much like the Bills did a little bit as well. And I liked what they added. Jonah Jackson is, is a real mauler uh, down low, has some real pedigree to him, even if he has some injury history. So there's this kind of like a in between move I like. Other teams, uh, the the Texans did some nice things and Daniel Hunter, uh, which gives them some juice. I've had had them kind of earmarked as a maybe drafting an edge, and now I'm not so sure. Uh, so I liked a couple of their moves as well uh, and adding maybe some doubles as well, along with the Daniel Hunter kind of home run move. Um, just to play off the Curtis Samuel signing a little bit more here, or at least get into a little bit more depth. We know that Brandon Bean had familiarity with him because he was there when that personnel department drafted him in 2016. And then we know Joe Brady had a year with him in 2020, which was the most productive year of his career. And it was interesting to hear Brandon Bean after the signing say, Well, when I was there, we had McCaffrey and we had Samuel drafted in the same class, and both of those guys were quote-unquote positionless players. You could line them up in the backfield. You could line them up out wide. And I get the sense that Bean feels similarly with Samuel and James Cook. Um, What do you think we could see, knowing Joe Brady has intimate familiarity with Samuel, now adding him with a somewhat positionless player in James Cook? Yeah, that's right where my mind went. It was that it's like a Diet Coke version of CMC and Samuel, what they're going on in Carolina. Just more connections. There's so many connections between the Panthers and the Bills. It's so funny. It's like the Packers and the Raiders. There's just all these random ones. But uh, but get ready for choice routes. So if you ever watch the Saints, which Joe Brady, uh, well, under Sean Payton, Joe Brady has experience in that offense. Get ready for a lot of in-breaking routes with Curtis Samuel and, and James Cook and using them both in the backfield and maybe motioning one out to create a matchup advantage. So that is where you'll see Joe Brady use those quote unquote positionist players. It's really slot or backfield type, as opposed to maybe they're on the outside as well. Uh, But getting two of them, we see the 49ers doing this with CMC weird. Uh, I wonder if that's a, a through line here of why you can do this, but CMC and Debo Samuel and doing the same types of things. All right. We get both guys in the backfield we can motion the running back out. And if they're in man coverage, now there's a cornerback in the box that has to defend the run. And we can just run it with Curtis. So you can do some interesting things. And Brady has some experience doing it. It's not just all theory. Um, I actually think he like prefers to do it. Because again, they were doing some of the stuff in New Orleans with different running backs over the years. Uh, so they they have some usage of using these types of guys. Also, that this kind of ties into our first discussion with the receivers. Why I kind of focus on outside receivers for the prospects. Just looking mid long term, Dalton Kincaid, best best in the slot, I would say best inside. Then you got okay, we got Curtis Samuel, best inside. Stephon Diggs even does some nice things inside on the, kind of this trajectory of his career. Khalil Shakir, can, I, I'm a big fan of Khalil Shakir by the way, uh, but he can do both inside and outside. But he might be best working from the inside as more. That's why I keep focusing for the draft prospects yeah. outside, outside, outside guys that can win on the outside truly. Yeah, and we kind of feel similarly. Uh, In the event that the Bills go defensive tackle, defensive end, edge rusher in round one, they don't pick again until 60. What what range or tier of receiver are we looking at maybe down there in the 60 range? Yeah, a guy I really liked just – I, I just think this guy's useful. If anyone has kind of focused on the top of the draft, there's Roman Dunze from Washington. His teammate, Jalen Polk from Washington, is basically a Diet Coke and Dunze. So it's kind of that Chris Godwin archetype, does the dirty work, can do stuff on the outside, can be a power slot, really, really good against zone coverage, uh, and can kind of just be a, a quarterback's best friend, and just a chain mover type. He's a guy that I think will go in that range, late second, early third. I have him as in my 30s on my big board. I'm just, I I think his upside is limited. I do not think he can grow into a number one, but I think this guy can be a a high end number two, just like he was in college. I just see his path to the pros being very clean. Um, He's just a useful player. That's one. If also looking, his teammate, Jalen McMillan, might be a little later. Mentioned Keon Coleman a little bit. Not sure where his landing spot is going to be from Florida State. 
he started as looking like a top 12 pick throughout the year, kind of fallen off big, big time as the process has gone along, didn't time real well. And also, but his GPS numbers are better than his time numbers. So kind of keep that in mind watching him. He's, I have no idea what the league thinks of him. I have no idea what I think of him. I've gone from him as number 20 to now he's like in the 40 for me. I, I have no idea <laughs> where he might go. So I might yeah. as well throw his name out there. Um, other guys there, Lad McConkey from uh, Georgia might be gone by this point in time. I think he's getting slotted way higher than this, but he's a super useful player, plays out, outside in, got a lot of twitch to him. Um, those guys uh, look to me as they would fit because they could eat a lot of targets and they could play on the outside. Which, which I think is what the the Bills should be going after in this draft. And you say this too as well. The, the uh, Keon Coleman is. I'm kind of with you. He's an intriguing prospect because, you know, he kind of bur- he transferred from Michigan State, went to Florida State, mm-hmm. burst onto the scene with a big opener, and then oh, yeah. and plays his production and play seem to be like you say a little top ten. But when you get the guy by himself in the field, he look he doesn't look like he can play. It's. I, I'm trying to figure him out, like because I mean, shoot, the play you guys are just showing on your on your video right now, like he'll do this thing where he's hurdling a guy, dunking on guys. You can see his basketball background all the time. Like I even wrote for Yahoo that even though he was a guard in in basketball, he plays like a power forward, and he, that's what he is. He's a ball winner. I would like it with Josh Allen just to see him pepper him. Hey, throw, go up and get it. But I'm not sure if that's the right fit for what they need because I think they need a little juice to kind of keep the take, kind of keep that offense open. Yeah, um, I think you you want to avoid the tightness, and I think that's happened the last year or two because they can't take the top off the defense. So that's where Keon Coleman is. is that your right fit? Not sure. Even if I like kind of what the player could be, yeah. But you're right. It, it's just that there's times where he's not creating any separation, and it's like yeah, the quarterback play wasn't great at Florida State. I know the name is people know the name of Travis and everything, but wasn't great as far as NFL terms. Yeah, they had six seven Johnny Wilson and six four Keon, six three Keon Coleman. And there's a lot of line drive throws, and it was really frustrating me. Uh, but getting maybe this guy in a better situation, you can maybe see him flourish a little bit more. Even Nate, thanks for the time. We'll catch up with you down the line this off season. Thank you guys for having me. That was a lot of fun.